Whether you're a skeptic or a believer, join me, Rob McConnell, as together we'll investigate the world of the paranormal and the science of parapsychology here on the Exxon Radio TV show on XZBN and the Exxon TV channel on Simul TV. Since 1990, the Exxon Radio TV show has been the place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. Together, we'll investigate UFOs, aliens, ghosts, Bigfoot, psychic phenomena, lake monsters, conspiracy theories, government cover-ups, the truth embargo, alien abductions, ESP, haunted locations from around the world, and so much more. With over 28 years of broadcasting and more than 4,500 individual guests, The X-Zone is truly a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality, as evidenced by the credibility, integrity, and professionalism of the guests that we bring to our international audience. If you have seen a UFO, had a close encounter, seen a ghost, Bigfoot, lake monster, or a story that you would like to share or have investigated, contact me, Rob McConnell, by sending me your email to xzone at xzoneradiotv.com or you can call toll-free 1-800-610-7035, extension 143, and on Skype, Exxon Radio TV. For more information on the Exxon Radio TV show with yours truly, Rob McConnell, visit www.exxoneradiotv.com or www.exxonetvchannel.com or simultv.com and xzbn.net. Until next we meet here in the Exxon from our broadcast center and studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Always remember Exxon Nation. Keep your eyes to the sky and your heart in the light. The Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Rob McConnell's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Exxon Radio Show or endorsed in any manner by Rob McConnell, Relmar McConnell Media Company, the Exxon Broadcast Network, its affiliated networks, stations, employees, or advertisers. Welcome to the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. And welcome to the Exxon, everyone. I am Rob McConnell, and for the next hour, I'm your host and your guide as together we cross the time-space continuum to this place that I call the Exxon. It's a place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. It's a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. And on this edition of the Exxon, we're going to be speaking to Matt Ralston. And Matt is a producer and editor living in Seattle, Washington. Matt has worked in the production industry for over 15 years as an editor and a producer. In no particular order, he loves horror films, puppets, his cat Scully, his newly built basement tiki bar, hmm. and he even, for good measure, mentions his wife, Melissa. Nice guy. Yes. Cryptozoologist in his, uh, is his second feature-length documentary, His First Love. Uh, his first, Love and Saucers, uh, garnered... Critical success and is coming off its 2017 festival run. It'll be available worldwide on most VOD and streaming platforms. His website is www.cryptozoologist.org. And joining me now is Matt Ralston. And Matt, welcome to the X Zone. 
Hey, thank you for having me. Happy to be here. Yeah, we're we're super. And uh, congratulations, first of all, on Love and Saucers and oh, the thanks. way it's being accepted. And uh, what was it, Matt? Let's go. Let's go back uh, a little bit in time. You know, get sure. into the Peabody Wayback Machine. And uh, what was it in time that drew you to to wanting to do something on cryptozoology? And where did your interest in cryptozoology come from? Yeah. Um, so I would say probably as soon as I could start reading. Oh, really? Yeah. That's kind of, I don't know, I was always into this stuff. I, you know, I remember in kindergarten being, or maybe not, maybe that's giving myself a little too much credit. First, second grade, by the okay. time I could really read. I was kind of the kid sitting in the corner with the vampire books from the library, just sitting by himself. Everyone else is reading Beckley Cleary. I had weird <laughs> Bigfoot books and yeah. vampire books and scary stories you could tell in the dark. You know? Yeah, because I, I was just thinking about what kind of books I was reading in grade one and two, and it was C. Dick Run. See Dick run after Jane. What is Dick going to do with Jane? You know, it wasn't like see Dick run, see Jane run. They are running away from Bigfoot. Yeah. Right. And, you know, part of it, too, is I grew up in Bellingham, Washington. Right. Um, almost as far northwest in Washington State as you can go. Uh, I just kind of remember even going to school, you know, some kid with some kid's uncle's friend said he saw a Bigfoot last weekend. Wow. It's, I mean, I'm not saying it happens all the time, but you know, it's more often than someone living in LA or something would have that experience. So, exactly. And I, uh, I think it's just part of the culture and area you grow up and hear more stories about things like that. Now, have you yourself, have you had a Bigfoot experience of one kind or another? Sadly, no. Um, I'm open to it. Mm -hmm. I want it to happen, but uh, no, never have. I haven't put myself out there enough probably to actually really experience one. Yeah. As, a, as a film producer, what is your take on the P Gimlin Patterson film of Bigfoot? Oh, um, boy, at this point, it's mm -hmm. so controversial with all the people that claim it's real and the yeah. people that claim it's not. And people deathbed confessions saying they were the guy in the suit versus, you know, Bob Gimlin's still out. Sure. Doing the, doing the rounds, talking about his experience. And I think, and this is kind of where the, the film plays well, is it almost doesn't even matter if it's real or not anymore. I think it's so much a part of our popular culture. Exactly. And you know, Bigfoot no is... No one's going to be able to, to prove whether it's real or not. You know, Bigfoot is right out there with Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny. That's right, right? yeah. He is, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's more merchandise, Bigfoot merchandise now that you can buy probably more than Easter, well, Easter Bunny for sure. Maybe not yeah. Santa yet, but. But we're seeing a lot of merchandise being targeted towards the, the paranormal and other phenomenon, ghost uh, with the Ghostbusters yeah. franchise and all the different shows that are out there. It's, it's, I believe it's going to catch up to the Star Wars franchise. Hey. You never know. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wouldn't doubt it, honestly. Um, one of the companies here in Seattle, uh, Archie McPhee's, has been doing a big line of Bigfoot products for a mm -hmm. long time. Been, been a big fan of. Yeah, they're good. So let's talk about your, your show, your new film. How is it going to be different from shows like Finding Bigfoot or other crypto shows and films? Sure, yeah. So, and I'm not knocking any of those shows. Reality TV is its own thing. Um, yeah, well, you see, I, I, I do that. I do that enough for both of us, so don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, it's. Um, I personally don't like reality TV I because think it's it's, it's not re as unrealistic. That's right. It's not reality. No, at all. It's all scripted. Yep. It's all rehearsed. Plus, with the Bigfoot shows, you never see anything. I mm -hmm. mean. There, there's nothing new that you really learn from those, in my opinion. Yeah. They're entertaining, and there's good characters. So that, honestly, is kind of, I think, where our film jumps off, is we're not going out to find a Bigfoot. We're not trying to prove anything exists. We're more interested in the people in this world and their personalities, why they were drawn to it. We kind of want to get to know them and hopefully draw some parallels between everyone who's in this field and kind of their interests and maybe start kind of honing down into 
if there's a particular type of person that is drawn to this or right. yeah, just, I don't know. I mean, honestly, the film's still in its kind of infancy. We've done a few interviews, but that's that's kind of the genesis of the idea. I think there's so many interesting people and really, really smart, dedicated people in this field that don't get a fair shake based on. I mean, those reality shows don't necessarily give cryptozoology a good name. Well, no, and, I, and neither do a lot of the ghost shows, the UFO shows, the monster yeah. shows, uh, because, like, I agree with you and, and and many other people who are credible within the industry mm -hmm. that they are anything but reality shows. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah. And I think, um, yeah, the, the people on those shows, it's so hard to make a living doing this. I don't know very many people that do. Yeah. Um, and by this, I mean being... A researcher into 14 subject matter there's it's more marketable today now than it was even probably five years ago but still unless you're a reality tv star you're you're having a hard time making ends meet just doing this thing. is there such a thing as a reality tv star <laughs> well i would say the guys on bigfoot or finding bigfoot were for sure people love those guys and they're awesome um yeah, but, are, are they the same guys? Who, rich are they the same guys who were out to hunt down Bigfoot and they were offering a million dollar reward for anyone who can come up with a dead Bigfoot? No, I think no, I, I believe there was another reality show. Again, I haven't seen it. It's called Killing. Bigfoot. That's right. That's right. I'm sorry. Yeah, there is a big difference. And I, the, the Killing Bigfoot show, I would go as far as to say, like I would never entertain even watching that. Finding Bigfoot, Bigfoot, I've seen and it. To me, it, again, it's well done for what it is, but it just isn't my cup of tea. But yeah, to put a bounty out on Bigfoot is pretty sad. Let Washington me... State actually tried to make it our state animal wow. uh, this year. It didn't pass, sadly. No, I, yeah. I, I was speaking to another uh, Bigfoot uh, researcher in British Columbia a couple of weeks ago, and, and I asked him a question, why isn't Bigfoot under the same protection that animals are under. Yeah, and I, I know it's been brought up um, mm -hmm. in certain circles before, and definitely in legislature, but uh, I mean, I think it should be. It's I, I think the fact that it's not uh, an animal, a proven species would right. probably be almost impossible to protect. But at the same time, it'd be cool to have that stuff on the books just to kind of Exactly. Make people scratch their heads even more for the true non-believers. You and I have to take our first break. Please stand by, uh, Matt. Exonation, our guest this hour is Matt Ralston, and his website is www.cryptozoologist.org. That's www.cryptozoologist.org. And we're going to be speaking to Matt about his new film, uh, about Bigfoot, and everything in between. And, of course, we're going to ask Matt about other aspects of his film, the project, the story behind the story. You're getting firsthand right here on the Exxon from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. My name is Rob McConnell. Whatever you do, don't go away. And if you'd like to um, find out about the programming we have available for you 24-7, 365 on the Exxon Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net that's the radio side and for the programming on the Exxon TV channel on Simul TV visit www.simultv.com
Welcome back, everyone. Matt Ralston is our very special guest this hour, www.cryptozoologist.org. And let me ask you a very simple question, Matt. Why hasn't Bigfoot been found? <laughs> well, who's to say it hasn't? Ah, I mean, very managed, good. Right? Very good. That's the first time hey. anybody's ever brought that up to me in, in 28 years of doing this show. I think I think people have definitely seen something and had experiences. Mm -hmm. It's about proving it. It's not finding it or I, I mean in my opinion if it doesn't exist today it yeah. absolutely did at one time I think there's too many stories from Native American folklore you go back to Lewis and Clark and Teddy Roosevelt yep. they all had experiences and sightings they had no basis to lie or create a story for for any sort of gain I mean if anything it made them look a little kooky yeah, you know what I find amazing? Here we are in a technological age that has never been seen before that we know of here on this planet. We have a camera in every cell phone, and we're just not talking about cameras. They're high-def cameras. We have satellites. We have Big Brother watching us all over the place with closed-circuit TV. I don't know how many thousands of Bigfoot groups there are out there. Mm -hmm. and, and yet... Even with trail cams, with night vision, uh, every piece of equipment you can think of, still no Bigfoot. And yet, these people go out weekend after weekend believing that they are going to be the ones to find the smoking gun to prove once and for all Bigfoot exists. That's true. Um, I actually, I did have, I went out with the BFRO uh, mm -hmm. for a couple of nights. Just... I'm not necessarily interested in doing Bigfoot hunting, but uh, I wanted to at least know what it was like to go out and the kind of things that happened. And Cliff Berrickman, actually, who was on Finding Bigfoot, um, he had a good line that he told us at one of our interviews we did. He said, Bigfooting is basically camping with a purpose. And that's really true. I mean, it's people going out and having yeah. fun and... It's kind of like the romance of the belief, I think, is what draws people to that. Not necessarily, I don't think there's too many people that think they're going to go out and find it, but it's sort of that kernel of a purpose. Maybe. It's possible. It could happen. Yeah. But, <laughs> but realistically, not. So I think most of the people that I met on that trip um, were definitely out there just to have fun and enjoy themselves, meet new people who are in kind of the same subject matter. So is, it, is, is, is finding Bigfoot, as well as the quest for finding UFOs, lake monsters, ghosts, has it turned into a social gathering event with very little hope of ever discovering what the auspices or what the alleged reason for getting together is? I don't know. I don't think there's little hope. Um, but I do agree with the social aspect. Mm -hmm. I think... As with social media growing and you can find more of, I'll quote, you know, your tribe. Sure. People who are like you and do your same kind of thing. I think it is fun for people like us to come together and meet up and talk about this because in my day-to-day -day life, I don't know that many people that are into this stuff. Yeah, my director and I, but we're kind of like, we just talk to each other about this and then occasionally we get to do mm -hmm. interviews and things. And if we're doing a screening, we get to talk about it, but... Other than that, most of the time, I just kind of joke about this stuff with people because not many people take it seriously. Um, who are some of the so, people? I'm sorry. Who are some of the people that you interviewed for your film? Yeah. So um, we, our first guy that we approached was Lauren Coleman. Oh, great guy. Yeah, Lauren's awesome. A great guy. He's, I really wanted to get his blessing on this film to start. Mm -hmm because I felt like he's been doing this for so long and yeah. this has been his life. And the whole point of the film is not to make fun of these people. It is really to show the serious side. And there is, I mean, believe me, there still is a fun side to it, but it's not silly. Yeah. Um, if you learn biology is fun. It's interesting. And Lauren bizarre. Coleman, in my opinion, is the, is the grandfather of yeah. cryptozoology as Stanton Friedman is of ufology and Brad Steiger, rest his soul, was in other aspects of the paranormal. Yeah, and I, I would consider Lauren that as well, yeah. the godfather of 
cryptozoology. Um, he would be very quick to correct you on that by bringing up Ivan Sanderson and uh, Bernard Huelvemans, who yeah, well, that's founded the here. study. But sure. Lauren was, when they were sort of aging out of it, he was kind of becoming a young man, mm -hmm. and he just grasped onto it, and he was the one that really took it and has kept it going. It, it would Cryptozoology probably would have faded into non-existence if Lauren Coleman was not around. I agree with you 100%. So what did Lauren have to say? Um, we, we did, we did a full interview with him at the museum, um, and we really got into like his history and how he became interested in this and his relationship with Ivan Sanderson and how he helped Lauren kind of, he encouraged Lauren to keep writing letters and research things. And that was really, he was sort of Lauren's mentor um, for this. And you know, Lauren was very, very he really wanted to make sure that that came across in the film about how he was kind of, oh, for lack of a better word, coached through it. Or I, I think a mentor is the best word. But um, you know, we got into some of the books he's written and um, how the museum got or got started and what cryptozoology is like today versus what it was 20 years ago. Oh, I bet you there's people who he thinks mm -hmm. are legit in the field who he thinks could maybe take over the mantle. He, he likes to say that, you know, he's not going to be around forever. Yeah. <laughs> I, Lauren, Lauren seems to be doing great, but I, I think uh, I think he's ready to kind of start passing the torch on. Um, he's been doing these uh, the international cryptozoology conferences for mm -hmm. the last, well, this year will be the third. So I think he's really trying to bring crypto out into more of the mainstream and do more events and things. What are some of the advances that have been made in cryptozoology or zoological research that you and Lauren talked about? Well, you know, I, I think the biggest thing is just it's social media and mm -hmm. cameras. Everybody has one, like you said. Yeah. Um, and we, I believe we did talk about this, but there's an analogy where it's, you know, why hasn't anyone got a picture of Bigfoot? Right. To that effect, why why can't you capture a picture of a chipmunk sitting in a tree? Because you got to get your phone out. By the time you get it on, turned on, it's gone. Um, there, there's kind of like those little stories that he brings up of like why. Well, well just says, hold on, hold on a sec here. Hold on here a sec. If you're going out looking for a chipmunk in the tree, your <laughs> camera is going to be ready. Right. True. If you're out looking for it, that's a different story. Right. So with all these people who are out looking for Bigfoot, they have cameras ready. They have, uh, you know, I, I've seen people with everything from a small, uh, a small cell phone camera to trail cameras to full-size broadcast cameras. Oh, yeah. And still nothing. Still nothing. Yeah. Who's to say? Um, I, I think everyone who has any interest in the subject matter does kind of agree that it is a very intelligent creature. Yeah. Um, so, and if it has any sort of common sense, it would stay the hell away from people. Smart. Very smart. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Besides Lauren Coleman, who did you speak with? Yes. So we, um, we've conducted an interview with Linda Godfrey, mm -hmm. uh, who was fantastic. We talked to her about the dogma and sightings out in Wisconsin, kind of that ethos and, and how that generated from her book that she wrote. Well, it was an article she wrote for a newspaper that then spawned her whole career in this field. She was definitely not like Lauren, where she had been doing this from a young age. It was sort of, she had an established career as a journalist. Mm -hmm. She had heard about this local story in her hometown of this girl who had seen, a, I mean, I'm just going to, a werewolf type sure. entity. And she wrote about it in her local paper and it, it just kind of took off and she started getting phone calls and more reports about it. So she started documenting the sightings, talking to eyewitnesses. She wrote a book and from there, you know, I don't know how many books Linda's written, but it's a number, a fair, fair amount of books. Um, we talked with Lyle Blackburn. We haven't completed all of our filming with Lyle yet, but we talked with him. He's kind of more of our like pop culture, um, cryptozoologist he seems to be he's strictly an author he doesn't do a lot of like field work he's more involved with like well the the uh boggy creek 
right? So it's kind of that's how he got into this world was seeing that as a young man. His dad took him to a drive-in in in Texas, and it burned an image on his brain that he never got out of his head, and he's been in love with that film ever since. I think he was just on the Joe Bob Briggs special on uh, Shutter for uh, trying to bring Joe Bob back, and they screened Foggy Creek, and it was a big success. But yeah, Lyle's great. Um, He he has a good book, um, Monster Bizarro, that he wrote for Rue Morgue magazine that really gets into the the history of Bigfoot in popular culture, how it started, all the films Bigfoot has been portrayed in, action figures. He's and he's a really great guy to talk to. And one thing I love about all the people we've talked to is just their intellectual aspect of what they do. All right, stand by, please, Matt. We've got to take our news break at the bottom of the hour. Exonation Matt Ralston is our special guest. Matt's website is www.cryptozoologist.org. And we'll be back on the other side of the news talking more about Bigfoot this hour here in the Exxon. My name is Rob McConnell, and we're coming to you around the world from our broadcast center and studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't go away. Nation, Matt Ralston is our special guest. He is uh, the gentleman behind Cryptozoologist. It's his second feature-length documentary. His first, Love and Saucers, garnered critical success and is coming off its 2017 festival run. It will be available worldwide on most VOD and streaming platforms. His website, www.cryptozoologist.org. Was there anything during the filming that you've done so far on this project that just blew you away something totally unexpected Mm, boy yes okay when we when we interviewed linda uh in wisconsin Mm -hmm. she took us out to a gentleman who has been having incidents happen on his property to this day uh he has documented as much as he has possibly could he's put up trail cams he claims that there is the beast of Bray Road or whatever dogman type creature mm-hmm. has been frequenting his property and stealing carcasses of deers he's been putting out for it. Um, some of the photos that he showed us, there was some stuff on there that was unexplainable. There, He showed us a couple photos, well, more than a couple, I would say dozens of photos of a black mist that would appear in the camera. It would trigger his trail cams and, like, Broad daylight, a black mist would show up, trigger the trail cams, and just fade away. And there's no explanation for it. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's there's things like that. Mm. I I'm definitely kind of the the fox molder of this world. I want to believe this stuff so bad, but until I have actual proof for something that hits me across the face, so I have to believe, I'm going to be a skeptic. Those photos that he had were. Mm. I still don't know what to think about them. They were really cool. Um, Seth Breedlove from uh, Small Town Monsters also did a project with Linda and this gentleman that I think you'll you'll see his project before you see ours. So um, when when that comes out, when Seth's stuff comes out, you can you I'm sure you'll get to see what I saw. Was- with all the different independent producers that are putting. Uh, small documentaries on the different video platforms. Is there a possibility that this will diminish the interest in the pro in, in the Bigfoot because it'll, it'll be overkill? 
I if we're not there yet, then I don't think we're gonna overkill it at this point. Um, <laughs> in my opinion, I I do think the one thing that separates us from kind of some of those other projects is we're really not focusing on Bigfoot. We're talking to Lyle Blackburn right. about Bigfoot, and that's it. Lauren talks about it, Yetis a little bit, but we're really not. Uh, we're not interested in trying to prove if anything exists. Yeah, it's basically a documentary on the, on the people who do the research. Yeah, exactly. Right. And just to kind of show the credibility and why they're involved and how they got involved and that there is something to all of this. Sure. Maybe these things don't exist, but there is still viable research being done. Um, especially, you know, with like the thylacine down in Australia, if, if it is proven that it is still in existence, then it will go under national protection, obviously, and become an endangered species. Maybe that's something that can be brought back. Mm -hmm. Who knows? Um, but, you know, so, yeah, we're kind of running the gamut between everything from Bigfoot to, well, the thylacine is probably one of the more likely to be found cryptids out there. I think. If Bigfoot is real and... If these researchers are doing everything they can in order to substantiate the claims of people who have witnessed or allegedly witnessed a Bigfoot, how come there has never been a cadaver of a Bigfoot found? Well, all I can tell you is some of the explanations that I've heard from experts. Okay. I'm an expert. I, I'm a filmmaker. I, I know nothing. Right. About this stuff. I only know what these guys have told me. You relay but, the story to the to the viewers right. and the audience. Right. I, I just want to make sure I'm not coming yeah. across as a big No, 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 no. no. <laughs> um, one of the explanations that I've heard from a few people, which I think is really interesting, is almost like a burial ritual where it's like humans, where when one of us passes away, mm -hmm. they're buried. It's not just like a dog that passes away in the woods or a deer and you find its carcass. These are supposedly family entities where they have groups and it makes sense when you think about it if that's really what if bigfoot exists and then everything that some of these researchers say about them being in groups and in families you you would bury your loved ones and i i don't know i i love that explanation i think i'm just going to stick with that oh it's kind of nice <laughs> and it puts bigfoot into a into a category of a of a family family uh, sociological group but but we have had moose hit on the highways we have had bears hit we have had deer hit we have porcupines and every other critter you can imagine except bigfoot yeah yeah that's true and i, I wish i had an explanation yeah. for you um, and you know, that what you're saying would probably go towards proving that Bigfoot doesn't exist or it's some sort of, I, I don't know, just folktale. I under, I understand, I understand the importance of keeping the myth alive because it, because it has spin off a nice little industry. <laughs> That's right. People are well, making, I, well, yeah. no, let's, let's call a spade a spade here. Yeah. All right. People are making money off of this, off of this myth, this legend. Just like people at Christmas time make money off of Santa Claus and at Easter time, Easter, Halloween, you know, and the list goes on and on and on. And I think that social media certainly hasn't hurt those who see dollar signs every time they cross a street and see a new angle. But when it comes to the legitimizing the existence how important then is it that we find out whether bigfoot is real or not i honestly think it depends who you talk to i think there's people in the world that could care less mm -hmm. if bigfoot is found what, what what does it matter i mean it could be a missing link it could just be a species of ape that you know like the gigantopithecus that did exist it's possible they could have migrated over to mm -hmm. north america but I mean, I think people have really made so much money off Bigfoot, and it's it's only going to get – people are only going to make more, um, especially if it gets found, I would imagine. Sure. 
holy smokes. But then, mean, then you had people like Tom Biscardi. I might a job change. You know, you, you had people like Tom Biscardi who, you know, nearly wrecked the entire Bigfoot research. Yeah, he was the guy in Georgia. Yeah. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like yeah. he, he did more to harm the industry that than was, anything else. Yeah, no, I know. And that's why cryptozoology kind of has the reputation it does um, because of things like that. Are, it, it's it, it's frustrating and mm -hmm. sad. That's another reason why, honestly, I think that we wanted to make this film was just to kind of be able to dispel some of those stories. Lauren actually brought up a good point. He said, the only stories you hear about in the media about Bigfoot are when people fake it. Yeah. You don't hear about credible sightings on CNN. You only mean Well, listen, you, you don't like, you don't hear anything credible on CNN. <laughs> That's true. You don't hear much credible on any news anymore because who knows what the heck's going yeah. on. But, um, but is that is it possible that that the reason why these stories aren't covered by media is because so many times the stories are told with absolutely no evidence whatsoever. Yeah, it's it's been done to death. Yeah, and that's. Yep, it's it's boring at this point. Absolutely, I, I have no interest in hearing someone else's Bigfoot sighting. Sure, um, just personally, but there are some unbelievable stories of pretty credible people or people that I would trust that have told me things that I'm, you know, I have no reason not to believe them. So, but if you, if all these stories are out there, Matt, how come there's no proof to substantiate any of these stories? That to me makes no sense as a former police investigator, and 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 a journalist and a broadcaster. It makes no sense. It it does make no sense. Um, but I mean, I would go back to. Are you familiar with the Grace Harbor sightings of the police force um, in Washington State? No, I'm sorry. Yeah. So um, I again, I'm not an expert. I'm going to get my dates wrong. But That's I want right. to say it's your opinion. In the 80s, um, Grace Harbor. Sheriffs have seen Bigfoot, they say. They actually have made casts themselves. And they will not go on record saying that they believe, but they will go on record saying that they've seen something. Um, if, yeah, wait a sec, wait a, wait a sec. What's the difference? If you're going on record saying you've seen, some, you've seen something. Well, just because they, the, they made a cast of the footprints. The actual officer went back and made a cast of the footprints. So this is what he saw. I see. Right? But, and apparently other members of the force are 100% like, oh, yes, they exist, but they won't go on record saying it. So that's something like someone like Lauren or Cliff Berkman would go talk to those guys. They would get that story, but then, yeah, I mean. It ends. How do you prove it? You exactly. can't. It's just all hearsay. Matt, and stand by. We've got to take our final break. Exxon Nation, Matt Ralston is our guest. His website is cryptozoologist.org, and we'll be back on the other side of this break as we wrap up this hour here in the Exxon from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't forget, you can get your complimentary copy of the X Chronicles newspaper online at www.xchroniclesnewspaper.com. <laughs> Matt Ralston is our guest, www.cryptozoologist.org. To your, to your knowledge, how many members of the accredited scientific community are involved in the investigation of Bigfoot? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I don't think there's very many. Uh, and I would say, you know, maybe Dr. Meldrum. Yeah, Jeff, Jeff Meldrum, Meldrum, yeah. He's probably one of the only guys I could think of off the top of my head. Um, 
we actually get to meet him next month out in Portland for Lauren's conference. So I'm looking forward to that. But I honestly, mainstream science isn't a big fan of this topic. Why not? Um, they poo poo it. Well, there's no evidence. Yeah. I mean, that's science. You got to have evidence. You got to be able to test things. Yeah. And this is me saying there's no evidence, but there's people out there that say they do have evidence. They have hair samples and things that have been, they've had them tested and come back unknown species and things. I. Well, that Again, ju that just that just means that. the the sample of the DNA doesn't register or match anything within the DNA bank. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, it's so science is never going to actually come around to this until there is an actual physical Cadaver. specimen to analyze. There are many people within the UFO community who believe that there's a connection between UFOs and Bigfoot. Yeah. Have you heard anything about that? Oh yeah, a lot. I think that's, I mean, it's a pretty fun thing to dive into. Um, the last film that my director and I made mm -hmm. is called Love and Saucers, and it's about an alien abductee. He, one of the beings he saw was a little, it wasn't a Bigfoot, but it was a, about a five-foot tall little hairy humanoid. was the first alien he ever saw as a kid. Um so, I mean, there, right there, I mean, they, it looks like a little Bigfoot thing he saw. And he, he, just to backtrack, the guy who did the film about is a painter. So he's mm -hmm. painted all of his experiences, the image that he painted and tells about. It looks like a little Bigfoot. Um, yeah, there's all the stories from, you know, aliens that apparently people think that there's Bigfoot is able to cloak itself with a cloaking device. It can become invisible. Um, it's not of this dimension. Who knows? I mean, they're really fun stories to get into, and I love reading about it. But you've mentioned the word point, you've mentioned you've mentioned the word fun several times. Mm -hmm. How serious do you take this then? If it's a lot of fun, I love cryptozoology so much because it's just dealing with the bizarre and the unusual and the unknown, and I think all these kind of threads of aliens and things that all kind of follows along that line. Um, I do take cryptozoology seriously as someone who just kind of ingests it and reads about it. There's so many, I think Bigfoot is the most fantastical of everything. I personally don't really believe Bigfoot exists, but there's so many other stories in cryptozoology or species that, I do think are going to be found. I do think that the uh, the thylacine in Australia is still around. Mm -hmm. We're working with Chris Rayberg down there, who claim he has audio recordings of it howling that he has not released yet. Um, he's played them for me. I've heard it. I don't really know what the thylacine sounds like, but it was pretty crazy sounding. Um, there's also, you know, in Indonesia, there's the um, orang pendek, and we're going to be working with Adam Davies uh, out in Indonesia to kind of follow him along as he does another expedition out there. And I, Lauren Coleman actually has gone on record saying he thinks that that is the next cryptid that will be discovered is the orang pendek. And it, it's not some paranormal entity. It is most likely a cousin of an orangutan mm -hmm. that walks upright, which is still an incredibly cool thing if it does get discovered. I mean, that's unheard of and never been seen before on this planet. It's pretty cool, at least in our lifetime. So in that aspect, it is fun because there's all these things out there that people just don't know about. And if you take the time to listen to the stories from educated researchers, you may just kind of start believing like, yeah. well, hey, man, if there's a unknown primate living in the jungles of Sumatra, who's to say there's not one in North America. But, but you just yeah. said listen to the educated researchers. Yep. And there is no education that could be acquired to become a cryptozoologist. So any of the education that these researchers have are self-taught. Well, uh, you know, Adam Davies actually is a professor. Um, he he does have the schooling, Lauren Coleman. I mean, all, these guys are all college graduates. But yeah, you cannot take a course in cryptozoology. You can't get a degree. In fact, if you watch our trailer, that's one of the lines that Lyle Blackburn actually said. Mm -hmm. There's no way to get... An accreditation for this it's just sort of a self-appointed title if if you go out looking for bigfoot and you decide you want to do that every weekend technically you're a cryptozoologist yeah so so basically, basically i'm one at this point so basically cryptozoology is a hobby yes 
for sure. A very serious hobby to some people. Some people, it's more fun. So, Again, for me, I like the more fun aspect of it. Um, but I'm really interested in what the people who do it for a living have to say. So and, the so cryptozoology is not unlike ufology or or ghost busting, except the object of the hunt or the object of the social gathering in one is Bigfoot, in another it's a UFO, and in another it's a ghost. Absolutely. And the, the one thing that separates cryptozoology from all that mm -hmm. is there are flesh and blood animals out there. Um, Where? That I'm looking for. Where? <laughs> well, the ring pendek and the thylacine. I mean, those are actual creatures um, that have been seen and cited and documented, but, especially in, in, in Indonesia. The ring pendek has been documented by the tribes and people living out there for a long, long time. Again, right. I'm not an expert. I can't give you specific data on that, but um, it it exists. I, I am pretty convinced after talking to some people that I do think it's out there. What happens five years from now, there's no Bigfoot found? Oh, nothing. Still the same. It's still a fun story. There's still going to be people making money off maybe finding it. There's still going to be reality shows. There's still going to be movies. No, nothing will change. It'll still be fun. I mean, it's, I, I don't know anybody who doesn't think Bigfoot's at least a fun thing to talk about or make fun of or, no, who knows? It could be out there. I don't think it is personally, but I want, I want it to be there. What changes would you make as a Bigfoot researcher yourself when it comes to the investigation and the research that should go into the into the more professional aspect of research when it comes to Bigfoot? Well, I don't think I can really talk to that, honestly, because I, I don't do that for a living. No, but I, you said that you call yourself a cryptozoologist because you well, go out by, on the weekend because warriorship. Because I'm into this yeah. field. Okay. I think, you know, there's people that only write books about uh -huh. cryptids. They are a cryptozoologist. Um, you know, you don't have to go spend time in the woods to become one. You just have to study and be interested in the subject matter to become one. So basically what you do with cryptozoology is take somebody else's experiences and apply them to your own methodology because there is no set standard for cryptozoology. That's a really good way to put it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Going out and talking to people who have seen things. And mm -hmm. then if you do that and you start documenting things and kind of do any little bit of research, yeah, absolutely. You become a cryptozoologist by default. So where are you guys uh, at with the film? How close to the final edits are you? Yeah, so we've so we've done interviews with Lauren and Linda and Lyle, uh, Scott Martis as well, who researches Champ and Lake Champlain. Yeah. Uh, we have all of our international shoots left so it's going to sumatra and it's going to australia tasmania um we're hopefully going to be going out to siberia for a really cool uh story i guess that one of our researchers have heard richard freeman um we're going to be filming in the uk as well so still i, I mean i would say we have a big chunk of the film left to do it's all of our international cryptozoologists haven't been represented yet but uh we're eager to start filming. We're still looking for some funding to make the rest of it happen. Yeah, I was but... just going to ask you, where do you guys get your funding for the film? <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's you not know. like you can go to a corporate sponsor and say, listen, this is our project. Here's our treatment. Uh, here's our pitch. And we'd like you to, you know, cough in because your your industry can can kind of get a spinoff revenue and your investment returned. Right. And, I, and you know, that's... Bigfoot and things like that, they are more marketable now. So more and more outlets are looking for content like that. Um, who who would have ever thought a documentary about a painter who had been abducted by aliens and lost his virginity to an alien would have become a film that made it on Amazon and Hulu. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, to that point, uh, you know, we're applying for grants. We're approaching. Uh, pitch festivals and things, trying right. to get funding. Um, we are bringing on a few other producers that I can't talk about right now that have some pretty good connections in the documentary world. But Europe actually is a, could be a good potential for us because they have they support the arts a lot more. And I think our film is definitely going to land more in the artistic vein as opposed to like a hardcore 
Bigfoot documentary. It's just not going to be that. It really is more about the people and personalities in this field and what's drawn them to it as opposed to uh, finding the creatures. So I, I think in that regard, mm-hmm. once people kind of understand we're not making a Bigfoot movie and it's really hard to separate, you know, it's that's just how it's going to be. We gotta Matt, we've right. got to say so long for tonight. I want to thank you very much for joining us. Thanks. And explanation if you'd like to find out more about Matt and his project, www cryptozoologist.org It's a great pleasure. We'll be back on the other side of this commercial break with the news as we continue here in the Exxon on the Simul TV network, on the Exxon TV channel, and on the Exxon Broadcast Network. Whatever you do, don't go away. We'll be back. With or without Bigfoot? Is he real? Ah, that's the question. Don't go away. Mm-hmm. 